Uh, my name is Alison Roberts. I'm a nurse colposcopist and I'm also a training manager at Zillico. And we would like to um, introduce you to Ms. Tony Byron, who's uh, the lead colposcopist at Birmingham Women's Hospital, who has kindly agreed to be with us today to talk about conservative management of CIN2. Um, so, Jenny, I just want to do a little bit of an introduction, first of all, so that we know that the natural history of CIN2, um, with particular notice to regression of CIN2 lesions, has been documented um, quite extensively in, in some of the academic literature for a number of years. And in fact, in 1993, Oster published a critical review of literature um, of the subject, which suggested that the likelihood of regression of CIN2 is around 40%, with persistence at around about 40% also, with progression to CIN3 at about 20%, and from there to possible inversion about 5%. So the management of colposcopy patients with CIN2 has traditionally been to provide treatment to remove or destroy the lesion following the diagnosis, much in the same way as for the management of CIN3. But more recently, colposcopy opinion has been to differentiate between CIN2 and CIN3 lesions and has moved away from immediate treatment of all cases of CIN2. There's growing evidence and recommendation for managing some CIN2 lesions with a more conservative approach. And I think that's now reflected in the new standards and guidelines within the National Health Services Cervical Screening Programme Publication 20, which is the Cervical Screening Programme and Colposcopy Management. And those new guidance, or that new guidance was produced in February of, of this year, 2020. So can you please just basically introduce yourself um, a little bit more than I have done and, uh, and introduce yourself and the role and the services provided at, at the Birmingham Women's Hospital, please. Yes, thank you, Alison. Thank, thank you to Zillico for um, inviting me to take part in this um, um, Zoom conference. My name is Jenny Byram. I am the lead for the colposcopy service at the Birmingham Women's Hospital um, in the centre of Birmingham. We see approximately 15 new referrals a year to 1500, sorry, new referrals uh, to the colposcopy service a year. Um, and we're the biggest unit, therefore, in um, the Birmingham area uh, for seeing women uh, with abnormal um, screening, um, cervical screening. We, um, I've been here at the Birmingham Women's Hospital for 18 years now, um, been doing colposcopy all of that time, and I've been the lead for the last eight years. Um, I am passionate about colposcopy, but also about providing choice for the women that come, um, particularly those of childbearing age. Um, I am also um, the chair of the Training and Accreditation Committee for the BSCCP, and um, long long been an advocate for the conservative management of CIN2 and in fact here in Birmingham we've probably been managing some women with CIN2 conservatively for over 10 years now. Thank you very much for um, telling us about your experience which is really extensive. So you know that um, the um, BSCCP undertook an audit of its members to gauge opinion about conservative management of CIN2. So of the members that responded to the, the audit, um, about 55% uh, offered um, said they offered conservative management of CIN2 in selected cases. And there was a small number of 12.4% that said that they potentially would offer conservative management of CIN2 in all cases. Um, this study was actually published in the Journal for Obstetrics and Gynaecology back in April um, 2018, so it's readily accessible for those members who want to see, see the findings in full. But um, it, it equally suggests that around about 32% of clinicians in this study um, don't offer conservative management at all. So could you perhaps tell us the reasons you advocate conservative management at CIN2 in your practice, please? Yeah, I think as a and an obstetrician, um, I can see the, the obstetric sequelae of um, extensive treatment to the cervix. And, and without doubt, um, large loop excision of the transformation zone and um, certainly uh, cone biopsies um, 
do damage the cervix and do increase the risk of preterm labour, uh, preterm rupture of the membranes and uh, second trimester miscarriage. And that has a huge cost, obviously to the woman, uh, but also to obstetric and neonatal services. Uh, it costs a, a lot of money to provide supportive care to a premature baby and um, we can't quantify the costs to women and it's at the time that we started using uh, conservative management it was a time where we didn't have an alternative to a loop excision and we felt in our department that Quite often in the past, we had a biopsy of CIN2, we went ahead and did a loop and then there was nothing in the loop. Um, and we felt that we were perhaps over treating women and in selected cases, so in women who were of childbearing age, who hadn't completed their family, um, who had small lesions, who had histological um, diagnosis of CIN2 and often our pathologists like the term focal CIN2 and it was that particularly that concerned us 10-15 years ago and so we opted to manage these women conservatively and we actually did a, a review of our data in Birmingham and we reviewed um, an 18, um, it was a, a two-year study and we found that of the women that we'd managed conservatively actually 80 percent of those women um, didn't require treatment and either reverted back to negative cytology because at the time when we were doing this in this was 2011 2012 the data that we did we weren't doing primary hpv testing or even triage that these women were reverting back to normal cytology within 12 to 18 months and weren't having to have um, go on and have treatment. Obviously, if women remained with high-grade cytology or um, lesions progressed, then we would offer treatment. Um, and in those cases, the majority of them did have CIN3. So we felt we'd done the right thing for them to treat them. And um, I think I wasn't alone at that time in, in feeling this. And many of my colleagues around the country were also doing the, a similar thing and I think we'd all we all have in our heads kind of what we feel is appropriate so and that's been reflected in the recent um, guidelines that in document 20 so in um, chapter 4 um, 4.7 uh, there is a, 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 a small um, section on conservative management of CIN2 and quite strict criteria um, and I apologize because I'm just reading this off but obviously and this is what we all felt, that colposcopic examination has to be adequate. So obviously we need to see the whole of the cervix and the whole of the transformation zone. And we need to exclude high-grade disease and invasion. And so you need biopsies, and ideally multiple biopsies. Um, if most of us would say that if there's a large lesion, so ex extended to three or four quadrants of the cervix, um, then that may represent underlying higher grade CIN and we might not opt to treat those women conservatively. Um, however, if you've got multiple biopsies and all of them show CIN2, I think it would be acceptable in some cases. Um, we would also advocate that uh, these women need to be reviewed at um, a multidisciplinary meeting and that's to review their cytology, review the histology, and that's to prevent any under or over call. And so that we can ensure that the right women are selected, but also that there's a consensus that it's the right thing to do for that woman. Um, we're talking about young women, really, women who haven't completed their family. Um, and um, some people would um, prefer not to offer conservative management in certain cases. So women who are heavy smokers, immunocompromised, particularly if they were HIV positive, um, if they were poor attenders. So the woman's got to engage with conservative management as well. Uh, we have to explain what the options are to her. She has to agree to it. She's got to agree to follow up because if we can't follow these women up, then we don't know whether they're going to need treatment or not. And that is a potential risk. And so the women have got to engage. They've got to be good attenders. Um, and, and then they do. 
the 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 uh, actual the regular follow-ups you need to see them six monthly and uh, repeat um cytology and repeat biopsies if necessary and only if they are reverting uh, back to normal usually within 24 months we would say if they've done it within 24 months that's fine if it's persisting for longer than that or their smears um, get worse so they've maybe have presented with moderately dyscariotic smear it's becoming se severe and it's not getting better then we should offer treatment i know that the actual guidance doesn't mention age ranges at all um, but we've, you know, we've, we've got, haven't we, young women, predominantly being for, for young women. Would there be an instance where you potentially would offer conservative management in an older woman, or, or would it, is it? Um, um, I think patient choice. Age, really. yeah. I think it's mainly women of child over age because what we're trying to achieve with conservative management is not damaging the cervix. And there is evidence that women over 40 and certainly over 50. Uh, with moderate or severe dyscariosis will have a higher rate of CIN3 and indeed uh, occult invasion. And so um, you could have raised, cause potential risk by not treating older, older women, certainly over the age of 50. Once a woman's reached the menopause, there isn't a, a reason to, to not treat. Although we, we could have a whole other debate about... Um, causing cervical stenosis and type 3 TZs and the difficulty that raises in postmenopausal women and particularly when they've had a previous loop so maybe we do want to prevent um, loop excision in older women but I think um, the consensus certainly in the colposcope community is that it should be reserved for women who haven't completed their family so that we avoid the obstetric sequelae of doing excisional uh, treatments. Just, just moving on a, a little bit, um, we, we know that, um, that you've been an advocate and have used Z-Scan as an adjunct to, to colposcopy since, uh, since its adoption by your trust in uh, 2018. So could you perhaps explain how Z-Scan supports your practice with the conservative management of CIN2 patients? And perhaps could you give us a case scenario or, or an explanation where Z-Scan has, has perhaps benefited patient management? Um, in this context for you? So with the head scan, if I have a woman who has a moderately or severely dyscariotic smear, she's of childbearing age, she is still wanting to have children, then I would always use the Z scan as part of my colposcopic assessment. I think it helps me to identify where best to place my biopsies. Um, and it can pick up disease in areas that aren't necessarily visible with um, acetic acid uh, colposcopically. So I think with my clinical acumen, um, areas of azito white and any areas that Z-Scan identifies as being possible high grade, then um, that helps to place the biopsies and can... Um, improve the sensitivity of your colposcopy and so that you're not missing any CIN3 or anything anything worse. Um, I think it can help for follow-up as well because if you've used it once and then you use it again although it's not exactly reproducible um, most women's cervixes are circular and um, if you start at at one o'clock and move to 12 o'clock you're going to be in pretty much the same ballpark uh, on the same cervix and I think that can help um, when somebody's in, in cytology is improving that you can see that there is improvement with the Z scan and I think that helps women as well because they can see on the Z scan or the print off that there have been been changes and um, and I think sometimes women are reassured more by a piece of technology than they are by a human being and yeah, so I was, was going to say, do you, do you think patient, um, do you think the patient experience is improved perhaps by being able to show them that scan findings in real time? Yes, I, I yes, it, it, in all, all circumstances, I think it, it helps the patient and reassures them. So if another clinician has seen a patient with a high grade cytology and perhaps felt colposcopically that it was low grade or possibly CIN2 and then taken the biopsies and then the biopsy's either been inadequate or 
the our pathologists love the ungradable CIN, um, then what we often do at our MDT is we'll decide to bring that patient back to see me for a further examination and a Z scan and then have repeat biopsies rather than diving in and saying, oh, it's ungradable or inadequate, we need to go ahead and do a loop. So I've certainly had um, patients where I've done a Z scan, um, we've chosen to do conservative management and then when it's been repeated, see, six months later actually the z scan is telling me that there is no high grade disease and that has that you know all the the points have come back as green and that's been reflected by an improvement in cytology and and that that means also that i'm not tempted to take another biopsy um but if there's if the z scan uh picture is improving then i'm more likely to just wait and see what the cytology shows rather than diving in and taking further biopsies um at that point if you if there was some uh, colposcopist interested in introducing conservative management of cin2 into a service that doesn't currently offer the, this particular practice what suggestions would you have in terms of the best way of approaching this to begin with well, I think now that there's quite clear guidance from Document 20 and the screening programme, uh, I think that we've that new units that want to introduce it have got something that they can follow. And so I think each unit needs to draw up their own code of best practice for managing conservative management, which should reflect the NHS CSP Document 20 guidance. Uh, and... Things that I would add to that is obviously this is for managing CIN2. We're not managing women with glandular abnormalities, certainly not managing um, any invasion. I think you could argue again that in some circumstances, in small CIN3 lesions, you may opt to conservatively manage for a short period of time. And I've certainly done that partly through patient choice and pressure, um, but also from my own clinical judgment that that was the right thing for that patient. Um, and so you need local guidelines, but they can. Ref uh, now you've got a document that helps you develop those. Um, I would also say that consider an adjunct because an adjunct can help, particularly in the accuracy um, of your biopsy placement and can improve um, your pickup of high grade CIN. And I think that's been shown uh, for the Z scan and for other adjuncts that these, these adjuncts do improve our colposcopic um, acumen and our ability to detect CIN, uh, high grade CIN, and um, makes you more reassured when the histology comes back as CIN2 only that you haven't missed anything, anything worse. So I think we we should offer it i think all units should offer it because i think it, we need to make sure there aren't any qualities in in colposcopy management across the country and it's not fair that some women get this service and other women don't so i have strongly adv advise people to consider it there is good evidence to suggest that it is safe um, in well selected cases there is guidance and evidence to support you in making that decision. And I think if you don't offer it, or, or at least consider it, then you need to have very, very good reasons. and You need to document why. That's great. Thank you again so much for your time. It's been really good to speak to you today. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Thank you.